If you have your Bibles, please open up with me a familiar place of Scripture that continues to contain the depths of the riches and wisdom, the knowledge of God that is not yet familiar to us. And this, these depths are so great that they expands into unlimited places. There is no end to them. This means that that means that this is how eternity will be. We will continually get to know God, always will be learning more and more about God, new things of the things God has prepared for us, not here just on earth, but also in heaven. And if here there's sorrow, the flesh, demons, lawless people, uh, they defile, they uh, this ability to fully apprehend, comprehend God, uh, these barriers will not exist in heaven. Today, for people who love the Lord, love Him, who have fallen in love with this truth, this is a great joy to get to know God by learning His and studying His Word that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Matthew 5, 45 and 48, the sermon that I would like to continue is called Call to Perfection, and this promise contained in the commandment is the inheritance of the saints of all generations, and this commandment of Christ is addressed specifically to his students. Therefore, people who do not accept God's delegated authority over themselves have no part in the inheritance that is contained in this commandment and are not able to have it, as they are not students. <clears throat> Possibly they are students of the Sadducees, Pharisees, or someone else, but not people that are placed by God in the church. Relevant to fulfilling this required commandment, we stop to study the purpose of the righteousness of God in the heart of man, specifically the goals that the righteousness of God abiding within our heart is called to pursue. And in part, we've been studying the purpose of the righteousness of God within our heart received by us in the two broken tablets in which we die by the law for the law to live for the one that died and resurrected and by doing so receive confirmation of our salvation in the new tablets of the covenant, in the format of the law of the spirit of life, so that we provide God proper basis to give us the promise to be heirs of peace, not by the past law, but by the righteousness of faith, like he gave it to Abraham and his seed. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Romans 4.13 We note that the righteousness of faith is determined by the obedience of our faith to the faith of God, which is presented in the preached word of God sent, together with the person who represents the fatherhood of God to us. Our faith and God's faith are different in that God's faith is the word of God that comes out of his mouth. Faith is from hearing the word of God. At the same time, our faith is obedience to that faith, obedience to the word of God. Therefore, the promise of the peace of God is given only to those men that have clothed themselves into the students of Christ, which allows them to be obedient to the order of God in accordance to which God sends us his word by the mouth of his delegated ones. Therefore, the covenant of peace within the heart of man is the result of the obedience of his faith to the faith of God, which are the spoken words of God's delegated ones. In a specific format, we've already looked at six signs by which we need to determine and examine ourselves as to whether we are sons of peace as well as the sons of God and have been studying the seventh sign. And this is our ability to clothe our essence into the holy and selective love of God. In other words, in sermons that I often call this holy love selective because people with a tolerant mentality don't understand because when you say just holy but when I 
indicate the fact that this is selective. Holy, holiness always separates one from another. Light from darkness, lawlessness from righteousness. A holy love, not just a simple love, which is why it is selective. He calls people, many come, and then he looks and chooses specific people, and the rest he throws out. And it's not because he wanted this. People have may, have have chosen that for themselves. They come to God, they repent, but then place their mind equal to God's and have refused to fulfill and to serve God within his order and say, I have my own mind, I myself read the Bible and can understand what is wrong and what is right. This is the problem, and only a small flock, a small group, who truly began or became his students. And so this is selective love. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. God's love, agape, is a unification of all of God's perfections that exist. You know, in the world there's nothing perfect. Any person of study will tell you, any professor will tell you that, that in the world there is no perfection. In the world everything is uh, a matter of opinion, but this is the bond of all perfections. When one uh, young officer asked me, what is love? God's love. You talk about God's love. And I told him, God's love is a bond of all perfections. That's the definition. He was surprised. He said, repeat it again. And I again repeated it. And he says, from where did you get this information? And I said, from the Bible. And he said, whoa, what a good book. It's the first time I hear that this kind of definition of love. There's so many uh, romances written and books of love, but there's no definition of love that it's like this, that is the bond of all perfections and perfections that are God's, not that of man. And so, and the, let the peace of God rule in your hearts by the means of this love within our heart, God's peace can rule to which we are called in one body and be thankful. Colossians 3, 14, 15. There are innumerable places of scripture about God's love, how it is. We've noted that according to this place of scripture, the reign of the peace of God within our heart is only possible upon one condition, and that is if the selective love of God will abide within our heart, and if we will be clothed into the selective love of God. Since in the selective love of God, which is the atmosphere of the peace of God, we see concealed the good, wonderful, eternal, and uncomprehending for the human mind goals and works of God called to build a unique and peaceful relationship between God and exclusively with his children. Because Jesus loved not just the whole world, he loved his church and committed himself for her, washing her with pure waters of the word, so she be holy and without blemish before him in love. It's the same thing the Heavenly Father has loved everyone who believes in this world, that everyone who believes in him in this world would not perish but have everlasting life. God loves those who love him and hates those who hate him. In the selective love of God, which is the atmosphere of the peace of God, we see concealed the good, wonderful, again, eternal and uncomprehending for the human mind goals and works of God called to build a unique and peaceful relationship between God and his children. In scripture, the character of the selective love of God is presented by the Holy Spirit. In scripture, by the preached word of the apostles and prophets in the form of seven unchanging elements, and these are them. Second Peter 1, 2 through 8. Virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. I will remind us that from days of old people began to call these seven the ladder of Apostle Peter. 
given to the church by which the church can rise to God or enter into the courts, into God's presence. And these virtues are inherent only to God, these qualities, and their identification is very different, their definitions, than those in dictionaries of the world. Each of the seven qualities of the fruits of virtue, these are fruits. We receive the seed of the tr of the truth and then we grow it into the fruit of these knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness. These are elements of the fruit. There's only one fruit, but this, these are all elements of this fruit. And so these seven qualities of the fruits of virtue are of the fruit of virtue contain the characteristic of all the other qualities. They flow one from the other, complete one the other, strengthen one the other, and confirm the truthful nature of one the other. These qualities, these seven characteristics, are called to be the moral perfection within our heart and an example inherent to the essence of our Heavenly Father. Third, the given qualities are the great and precious promises entrusted to us through Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ. Fourth, the given qualities presented in these seven characteristics are the imperishable treasure and unsearchable wealth of Christ with which we need to become rich and that actually are called to be revealed to us in these last days. For thousands of years the Church of Christ was not able to know the fullness of how she can be perfect, she only knew in part and apostles wrote about this in the last days by the power of God through faith God will begin to reveal this imperishable treasure that is holy and pure fifth in order to receive the inheritance of these qualities these seven unchanging characteristics it is necessary for us to receive the power of the Holy Spirit as the Lord and Master of our life which is only possible when we leave our nation, the house of our Father, and our corrupt desires. And when we leave them, purify ourselves from dead works, because this is cleansing yourself from dead works. Only then will Christ be able to, by the power of the Holy Spirit, enter as Lord and Master into our heart when in our cleansed conscience these twelve base elementary teachings of Christ will be imprinted. Six, the means that we are to use to receive the power of the Holy Spirit as the Lord and Master of our life is the obedience of our faith to the faith of God as the elementary principles of Christ. Seven, by inheriting these great and precious promises in the form of the fruits of our spirit we become a part of God's divine nature which is why the, the confessions of the faith of our heart become in power equal to the power of the words that come out of the mouth of God since the selective love of God demonstrated in these seven unchanging qualities and characteristics have nothing in common with and cannot have anything in common with the nature of human love that is filled with egoism, is greedy, and is just temporary. It is the power of the selective love of God in the format of these seven qualities of unearthly virtue that is called to enthrone the resurrection of Christ in our earthly bodies, destroy the stronghold of death in our body, and resurrect li the life of Christ within our body, in, in our new person. That is, clothe us into immortality and incorruption when this earthly body <coughs> will become immortal and incorrupt. This earthly body, we're not talking about the heavenly body. The scriptures say that these earthly bodies will become this way. <clears throat> if Adam, a person of the, he was still a man of the flesh, he had an immortal body, incorrupt body, and only after he sinned did death enter. If you can imagine when people that are not of the flesh but of the spirit, they have their new person, they are spiritual, and this spiritual new person who by nature is like the nature of God lives within the body then God by the power of this new person where his nature is will destroy the stronghold of death by the confessions of the faith of a man 
And so the bond of perfection of the selective love of God is unconditional when it comes to the seven qualities of virtue. Unlike the tolerant and egotistical love of man, the unconditional nature of the selective love of God in the seven qualities of virtue is different in that it contains the burning jealousy of God, all his knowledge and his absolute wisdom that in no way is able to be used for greedy and egotistical selfish purposes and goals of man. At the same time, the tolerant love of man toward other men is very conveniently used for greedy and egotistical goals and purposes because the tolerant love of man is blind. It is not led by the mind, it is led by feelings. And the feelings don't have light in themselves, the light of the mind. The light of the mind is not in feelings, it is in a renewed mind. Here is what the scriptures say regarding the strength of the love of God. Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm. For love is as strong as death, jealousy as cruel as the grave. Its flames are flames of fire, a most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench love, nor can the floods drown it. If a man would give for love all the wealth of his house, it would be utterly despised. Songs of Solomon 8.6.7 The measure of the love of God, according to Scripture, is identified by and is known by the measure of God's hatred toward evil and men who do this evil. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Hebrews 1.9 Considering that righteousness and lawlessness are programs that by themselves are not able to demonstrate themselves out of a programmable system, a programmable system is the heart of a man. And so for the heart of man there is a battle between, the battle happens between the powers of light and powers of darkness to be able to put their program into this heart and a person chooses which program he receives and this is who he will become. God has loved righteousness and carriers of, of righteousness and hated lawlessness and carriers of lawlessness. This is seen in many places of scripture. The Lord tests the righteous but the wicked and the one who loves violence his soul hates. You see, if people say that God loves everyone in general, it says those, the wicked and the one who loves violence, his soul hates them. But people say he loves everyone in general. So in whose Bible do you read this? In God's Bible, he does He hates them. Upon the wicked he will rain coals, fire, and brimstone, and a burning wind shall be the portion of their cup. For the, lo the Lord is righteous, he loves the righteous, his countenance beholds the upright. If he loved everyone in general, he would not be God. He would not have been righteous, he would not have any justice. He would be an unjust God if he poured his rain and shined his sun upon the one and the other in the same way because his rains are poured out upon the righteous as a blessing and for the unrighteous as a curse. His sun uh, shines upon the righteous as a blessing and shines upon the wicked as a punishment. Only loving what God loves and hating what God hates, we <clears throat> are able to demonstrate God's perfection in his reaction toward the righteous who perform good and the unrighteous who perform lawlessness. The selective love of God by its unchanging nature in the form of seven supernatural qualities is called to grow us into the fullness of the growth of Christ or lead us into the perfection that is like the perfection of our Heavenly Father so we can shine the light of our Son upon the just and the unjust and pour out our reins according to God's intentions upon the righteous for good and the unrighteous to punish them. Considering therefore that these seven qualities of virtue identifying the selective love of God do not have an analog in, in the earthly realm of the human lexicon or any dictionary of the world. The love of God is the foundation and atmosphere of the moral and immovable law opening within our heart the essence of God and the essence of the heavenly kingdom. And this is not all the love of God. Agape is a sovereign love, which is unconditional when it comes to the people it chooses in its abilities to foreknow and predestine. God, by nature, before the creation of the world, foreknew us 
and loved us with an unconditional love, these that whom he foreknew. Because he knew that these people, when they uh, hear the truth, they will not spit into the face of that truth. They will not spit upon the face of Jesus as the elite religious uh, P, uh, persons of that time did that hit him and spit in his face but these who have received they being spat, spat upon just like they did upon Jesus will go together with Jesus I remember how one of the servers uh, had spit in my face in front of everyone I was passing by And I just wiped my face and kept going. And I thought for in myself, Lord, how is it that I was found worthy to be able to be spat upon so I can overcome persecution for the sake of your truth? This happened when one wicked person confronted his God's church as soon as I began my service he he performed division and split the church and I said who is of the Lord come with me and not more than 30 people actually remain remained and uh, the rest went with the other person and when we had scheduled our service they were waiting for us to leave and one of them spat in my face if you want to be Christ truly then prepare yourself that they may persecute you and Jesus said as you have continued with me in my trials I will bestow a kingdom upon you in a specific format we've already looked at the demonstration of the selective love of God in the qualities of virtue, knowledge, self-control, and perseverance, and stop to study the virtue of the love of God in the mystery of its great godliness. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. 1 Timothy 3.16 And God has done all of this by his church, by the chosen whom he foreknew and predestined so that they be in the image of his son. By demonstrating the signs of the fruits of godliness, we identify the true quality of the love of God agape within the heart of a man, in his words, his actions, and the manner in which he dresses which isn't supposed to prompt the instincts of the opposite gender. In other words, you may dress uh, in style, but classical style, because today Satan, by those uh, uh, leading these, uh, these uh, fashion, the fashion world today, undresses uh, people more, the more, more and more. In the olden days, it was those that undressed themselves were those that in the cemeteries who would live, people that were not of the right mind. But today, people that are older or younger, and especially, and so people who uh, are older, uh, for some reason, they're starting to think, thinking that they're looking younger, dressing uh, in very short dresses or very tight clothing. Try that you uh, try to dress in a way that makes you look elegant and beautiful. A person that looks elegant and beautiful is more sexually attractive than a person that trying to show all of their uh, intimate places. A person who wants to get married will never want to take for themselves such a woman that is trying to undress or isn't dressing dig uh, with dignity. A husband is jealous of his wife when another man looks at her, uh, when, when, when other men are looking at her in, the way, in, in another way, that is of course if he is uh, a man of dignity. 
Further, we note that there's a fundamental difference between the goodness of God and his favor toward man and the godliness of a man which he is called to demonstrate in his love to God. For example, the godliness of man is his favor to God, a man's grace for God and his thanksgiving. The godliness of a man is the ability to visit the fatherless and widow in their hardship and keep yourself from being defiled by the world. The godliness of a man is imitating Christ and meditating about the things of the hills, seeking God in his good, acceptable, and perfect will. The godliness of God is his thanksgiving. It's a response to the thanksgiving of man. It's his goodness toward man, his favor and his grace toward man, his mercifulness toward man, his thanksgiving towards man, his good work and good acts as a response again to the good work and good acts of man toward him, his kindness in the absolute sense of the word. Turn to you and I will turn to me and I will turn to you. Aside from these characteristics called to identify the character of godliness, there is also a counterfeit form of godliness in the church that exists as well that will conflict with and resist the true form of godliness. Having a form of godliness but denying its power and from such people turn away. 2 Timothy 3, 5. If we don't break our relationship with people that have the look of godliness and will not distance ourselves from them, then they will corrupt our godliness that is contained in our good habits, which is why we together with them will inherit the prepared for them destruction. Relevant to this fact, we stop to study one of the signs in question four, by which we need to determine as to whether we are clouds of the Most High. Also with moisture he saturates the thick clouds, he scatters his bright clouds, and they swirl about being turned by his guidance, that they may do whatever he, God, commands them on the face of the whole earth. He causes it to come whether for correction, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. He sends his Son and his reigns, and we see how he sends them. He causes them to come whether for correction or for his land or for mercy. Listen to this, O Job, stand still. This is not a tolerant love. This is a holy love. Stand still and consider the wondrous works of God. Do you know when God dispatches them? his clouds and causes the light of his cloud to shine. Do you know how the clouds are balanced, those wondrous works of him who is perfect in knowledge? Job 37, 11 through 16. And so dispatching his clouds for correction or for his land or for mercy according to his will means to be a carrier of the favor and punishment of the one that is perfect in knowledge. This is one of the fundamental elements by which we need to examine ourselves as to whether we are collaborating our favor with the favor of God. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell severity, but toward you goodness, if you continue in his goodness, otherwise you also will be cut off. Romans 11:22. According to this place of scripture, we see that God's severity is to cut off from God, you will be cut off from God. And so demonstrating God's goodness toward one and his severity toward another, we become carriers of his justice within his holiness. The phrase, do you know when God dispatches them and causes the light of his cloud to shine, indicates the fact that not all clouds are able to be clouds that God dispatches and cause the light of it to shine, but only those clouds only those clouds again which provide God a basis so that they can contain his moisture in themselves this living moisture this is confirmed by another place of scripture also he binds up the water in his thick clouds yet the clouds are not broken under it under these waters of life he covers the face of his throne and spreads his cloud over it Job 26 8 9 God has uh, spread his cloud over his throne. That means that his throne is in his clouds, which contain the waters of life, this moisture. And to differentiate the clouds of the Most High in the form of the saints that fear God from profane to his nature clouds in the form of pseudo-saints that do not have in themselves the fear of the Lord, it is necessary for us to know that our ability to provide God the proper basis to fill us with his moisture and our readiness to scatter his light and direct it according to his guidance 
is our function. And fulfilling this function, we then demonstrate our favor to God. The function to fill us with moisture so that we can be led by the Holy Spirit and be turned by His guidance is God's favor, which is His response to our to Him favor, demonstrated in our readiness to be filled with His moisture. It is necessary for us to study a series of questions. First, what virtue do the scriptures give the cloud of the, uh, the cloud of God? What purpose does the cloud of God fulfill? What conditions do we need to fulfill so that God establishes us as His clouds? And by what signs do we determine that we truly are the clouds of the Most High? First, to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect, it is necessary to scatter your light from your cloud upon the just and the unjust and pour out the receive from God moisture in the form of rain upon the righteous and the unrighteous. Second, we are called to release the moisture we have from the Heavenly Father in the form of rain and scatter His light according to His will and not according to our whims or our conclusions. In the New Testament, the meaning consisting in the purpose of being a cloud of God is laconically presented in the following words. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Romans 8.14 <clears throat> it is not all that are baptized by speaking in tongues are the sons of God but that are led by the Spirit of God I grew up in a Pentecostal church that was unregistered and they considered that if you speak in the whole in in tongues this means you're led by the Holy Spirit but here it, it isn't written that all that are baptized in speaking in tongues are the sons of God and I sometimes would uh, would bring this up with people who said these things and I said to one of them, one gentleman he was a uh, very rooted Pentecostal gentleman and I asked him, can you show me where it is written that all that are baptized in speaking in tongues are the sons of God and he said, yes, show me. Uh, uh, I needed time to... Uh, uh, he needed. T he said he needed time. And so after a couple of hours, he came to me and said, you know, I haven't found... I looked through the entire book, and I know it's somewhere, but I can't find it. And I said, you know why you didn't find it? Because there's not a place like that in Scripture. And he looked at me, no, he says, it has to be all of the people, or all the brothers are always talking about this from the stage. Yeah, they also say, make uh, one step toward God and he'll make two toward you, which is also not in the Bible. And there are many things that they say that as if are in the Bible, but are not. And when I showed him what that meant, he became afraid and said, so so what? It turns out I'm not saved. And then I explained to him what it means to be led by the Spirit of God. And so he says, what? I'm not saved? He was proud of how he... Uh, how he treated his wife, uh, that he would uh, hit his wife and she made her uh, thank him for hitting her because he is the Lord and he over his wife, he says, and I can do whatever I want and it's God's will. And I told him, because you behave this way with your wife, you will perish and your wife will be saved. And because she is a, a fierce God and is incorrectly taught. She gives you the ability to treat her this way, although according to scripture she needs to leave you and remain that way or go marry another because you stop being her husband. A husband is not given to hit his wife, but to caress her with, with love as Jesus does that he tell her when something didn't work out for her not to blame her but say it's okay it will work out next time it's not as this is this will be fixed give her op opportunities one sister once came to me and said pastor what do I do I finished technical school and I was a cook in a very good restaurant but now I'm with my husband 
and everything is I'm either not cooking it right or not salted enough or salted enough and I don't understand what's going on and I said how does the husband react to that he says may your soup be cursed because you again over salted it you see he is cursing your food your work and instead of blessing it if he would have blessed you then things would work but because he's cursing you nothing's working out even if you finished a uh, schooling for it if we are not in accordance to the requirements of a cloud of God capable of being filled with his moisture and scattering his light for the purpose of correcting one and demonstrating mercy upon another, then our sonhood needs to be seriously questioned. When it talks about clouds lacking moisture who are tossed to and from by all kinds of de deceptive teachings that are profane to God, we have been studying the category of people located within the Church of Saints that do not have the Spirit of the Lord and resist the Spirit of the Lord and unfortunately uh, the majority of them are usually like this and that includes often the leaders as well it says in the Bible are there even 10 people that may not have defiled their clothing they're the ones that will walk with me when looking at the clouds of the Most High as the co category of saints that are led by the Spirit of Holy Spirit by the means of their new person created in accordance to God in Christ Jesus in righteousness and holy truth and this means that the clouds of the Most High can only be those saints that have grown into full measure of growth in Christ and are in accordance to the demands of perfection that is inherent to God further we've noted that the clouds of the Most High that are within God's possession is a symbol of his great mystery and is called to fulfill a vital role in the work of adopting and redeeming our body from the law of sin and death. In Scripture, the cloud of the Most High is a, in Scripture is a symbol of the glory of God, the place where God abides, the clothes into which God dresses, and the midst from which the Lord speaks. In a specific format, as much as the Lord has allowed in the measure of our faith, we already looked at the first three questions and continue to study now the fourth question. By what signs do we determine that we are the clouds of the Most High? I, in short formulations, will remind us of the essence of the first four signs, which have already been the subject of our studies in the previous services, and afterwards we will turn to study the fifth sign. The first sign by which we can examine ourselves as to whether we are the clouds of the Most High consists in our deliverance from Egyptian slavery. Saints who will not allow God to deliver them from Egyptian slavery, which is identified as the position of spiritual infancy, will never be able to be the clouds of the Most High, filled with His moisture and pour out His moisture in the form of rain, according to God's guidance as correction for the one and mercy for the other because they will consider that God loves everyone in general. Second sign by which we can examine ourselves as to whether we are the clouds of the Most High consists in having a goal-oriented and active waiting of the Lord Jesus. The third sign by which we can examine ourselves as to whether we are truly the clouds of the Most High consists in our ability to collaborate with the intelligent aspect of the mind of our mind with our new person demonstrating the mind of Christ and in our spirit and the wisdom of God in the mind the fourth sign by which we can examine ourselves as to whether we are truly the clouds of the most high consists in the ability of our of our power to rule within our body over all peoples nations and languages <clears throat> I was watching in the night vision and behold one like the son of man coming with the clouds of heaven he came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before before him then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples nations and languages would serve him his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed Daniel 7 13 14 we're talking about the clouds of heaven that they are accompanied the, the Son of God goes together with these heavenly clouds understandably first in the given prophetic vision it's talking about the return of Christ for his bride for the millennial reign 
which will begin here on earth and afterwards will transform into time eternal. However, so that we in the status of his clouds to be accompanied by the Lord, who as the Son of Man receives from the Ancient of Days dominion, from the Ancient of Days, that's from the Heavenly Father, dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations and languages should serve him, it is necessary to allow Christ to be enthroned by the Holy Spirit within our body over all peoples, nations and languages. Whether this information is fitting in our mind or not, whether we agree with it or don't agree with it, that doesn't change the facts or essence. Due to the genetic program which we have inherited from Adam, within our body live all peoples, nations and languages with their own constitutions, with their own habits and their distinctions. From one blood he had created all men and this a uh, program began to pass on from one to the next and although there are different nationalities different nations and, la and peoples in every individual person all the nations languages uh, their laws cultures are in every person and they demonstrate themselves within our body by the corrupt desires of our soul which is supported by our old person representing this programmable system I'll read this place. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offer offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead, Acts 17, 26 through 31. The symbol of the world doesn't mean the world that lies in darkness, but the category of men who received salvation in the format of a guarantee, which is why they are a nation of God. These twelve Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out demons freely, and you have received freely give. Now whatever city or town you enter, inquire who is in who in it is worthy and stay there till you go out and when you go into a house greet it if the household is worthy let your peace come upon it but if it is not worthy let your peace return to it and whoever will not receive you nor hear your words then depart from that house or city shake off the dust from your feet assuredly I say to you if it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than that for that city Matthew 10, 5 through 15. In other words, the church of saints, then as well as today, are overfilled with perishing sheep of the house of Israel. But no one is telling them about that, and even if someone is telling them, they react with disdain and reject the one who speaks. And the most as icy and fortunate thing is the circumstance that these perishing sheep, for some reason, with an unusual passion and with big for them materialistic spending, have decided to save the world in other countries countries forsaking their own soul, their house, and their nation, and unaccountably convincing themselves that in this way they will confirm their salvation and will place God in such a position where he won't have a choice and won't be able to refuse them. According to the words of scripture, God is not vigilant over what we think and convince ourselves of, but over his word. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord. Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Matthew seven twenty-one through 23 <clears throat> 
The will of God for each of us consists in us being able to bear fruit to God with which we can then obtain authority over our essence so that all of the peoples, nations, and languages within our body would serve God. Only after this are we able to become the clouds of the Most High and be the salt and light to the world, first for your own house and second for the nations and peoples amongst whom we live. The phrase, And behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the cloud of heaven, he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him, means that ahead of the saints there are that are being led by the Holy Spirit walks the leader of their salvation and the perfecter of their faith, who was given authority to approach God, so that together with the Son of God and the status of the Son of Man, we be brought by the Holy Spirit close to God, and it is necessary to give the Holy Spirit the proper basis to place us in Christ, or to open the truth that is within our heart, how we need to approach God in Christ Jesus, whom God has placed, so that He be the, the lead median or lead intercessor. Their nobles shall be from among them, and their governor shall come from their midst, that I will cause him to draw near, and he shall approach me. For whom is this who pledges his heart to approach me, says the Lord? You shall be my people, and I will be your God. Jeremiah 30, 21, 22. Here it's talking about Christ and about those who have received the mandate of Christ, whom he sent, saying, who, as the Father has sent me, I send you. To become the captain of the chosen by God remnant, the Son of God needed to incar be incarnated among <coughs> the chosen remnant to become a sacrifice for their sin. On the, <coughs> on the death of the cross and the status of a son of man will allow us this will allow us by the cross of the Lord Jesus to separate ourselves from our nation from the house of our father and our corrupt desires being clothed into fig leaves of personal good work only in the death of the Lord are we called to receive the right to the power to raise to be risen with him in his resurrection which will provide the Holy Spirit proper basis to place us into Christ where we will then receive the ability to bring us close to the ancient of days not being placed into Christ we will never be able to enter before the face of the Lord or will be or will never be able to be in Christ to be brought close to the ancient of days to be placed into Christ means to be <clears throat> an organic part of the body of Christ as the bride of the lamb which is identified as the category of the chosen by God remnant Oftentimes I get the question am I in Christ or out of Christ God places us in Christ as a guarantee Yes, truly, all of us, when we're born, we're born in Christ. God cannot do an anything with man who is out of, with a man if he's out of Christ. He does everything in Christ. But this is a guarantee. You are brought into a house and says, this house, you can live in it upon the condition that you will find the means to buy the house. If you won't find the means to buy in the house, then you will be thrown out of this house. And so, yes, you're saved in hope and you're placed into Jesus, but this is a guarantee. Now you need to confirm yourself in Jesus so you're not be, uh, thrown out of Jesus. And so to be placed into Christ is to be an organic member of the body of Christ as the bride of the Lamb, which is identified as the category of the chosen by God remnant. Only finding a good wife in the form of a church of saints, the infrastructure of which would present God, God's order of theocracy, we receive the ability to form ourselves into a cloud of the Most High to receive the right to the power to be led by the Holy Spirit. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Proverbs 18.22 If a person will not find a good wife, then he will lose the grace of God which he received as a guarantee. And we know it's not talking about a regular wife or a woman he, in the physical form because many of us have gotten married and if the wife was truly grace for you, God's grace for you, then you would be joyful, but as much as I know, for the most part, Christian, Christians in their marriages live an unhappy life because the husband doesn't understand the wife and the wife doesn't understand the husband and they both suffer. 
this talks about the fact that a husband is not a grace for her husband a husband is not a, a grace for his wife and wife is not grace for her husband and so grace only is in the church and the church is this good wife by which we can receive this grace if a person will not understand the great mystery of the body of Christ in the form of a good wife she will never be able to understand that salvation that she receives is a guarantee which needs to be turned to profit in the death of the Lord Jesus to establish it in his resurrection a person who has not allowed the Holy Spirit to establish his salvation in the resurrection of Jesus Christ will never be able to be led by the Holy Spirit and furthermore will never be able to be built into a cloud of the Most High that can be turned by his guidance and pour its rains upon the just and on the bless uh, as a blessing and upon the unjust as a punishment. The fifth sign by which we can examine ourselves as to whether we are the, truly the clouds of the Most High is our ability to be ready to fulfill the calling of his clouds. When he utters his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens, and he causes the vapors to ascend from the end of the earth. He makes his lightning for the rain. He brings the wind out of his treasuries. This is Jeremiah 10, 13. And also, whatever the Lord pleases, He does in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all deep places. He causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain. He, 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 he brings the winds out of His treasuries. And so the visible uh, heavens and earth are a symbol of the one that is spiritual or heavenly. The heavens are God's home. <coughs> that is identified in Scripture in three uh, in three different uh, things. And so these places, these places are are united into one. First, these are the heavens that are in the fourth realm which are beyond the physical vision and also cannot be seen with anything else. This is also the unseen for the physical eyes uh, temple of God and this is the unseen for the physical eyes spiritual status of the heart of a man that is his humble and contrite spirit. For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Isaiah 57, 15. The goal of abiding of God in his redeemed people is to erect them, draw them out from the death of the Lord Jesus Christ so that he can then destroy the stronghold of death and sin, living within the body, being supported by organized powers of darkness. And so looking at these places of scripture <clears throat> out of something or work that is being done within the body of man, is to remain in darkness to understand what is beyond our physical vision in the unseen heavens that by the voice of the Lord the waters uh, turn and uh, by his guidance and then the work he also does he does with his clouds we need to answer a series of questions what do we need to consider as the heavens in our body? What waters are in the heavens of our body? And what is this noise? What does it mean? What is this earth in our body? And what boundaries or ends of the earth is it referring to? What are the lightnings? and thunders that he speaks of here and also the wind what is the wind that he brings forth from his treasuries in our body and before we answer the series of questions linked with the work of the truth within our heart and the Holy Spirit that reveals the truth in the heart we need to note that all of these actions all this work is inspired by God and happens according to God's will and is his will as it is written 
Whatever the Lord pleases, He does in heaven and in the earth, in the seas and in all deep places. Psalm 135, 6. And so this work on earth as well as in the body of man, there's a specific condition and rules. The Lord pleases, does every, all that He pleases in heaven and in the earth and His seas only by His clouds, His people that have become food and drink that quenches their spiritual needs. And so, what are the heavens within our body? What are these waters? Th th is it referring to that will move according to God's command? The heavens within our body are that aspect of our spirit that responds for worship, where a person can hear how the waters move in heaven and hear what God says, and God will hear man. Furthermore, this is the aspect, the part of our spirit, where there's a collaboration of two formats of godly wisdom, the Urim and Thummim, that are in the body representatives of the two great witnesses that stand before the God of all the earth. And as we more than once have noted, according to this place of scripture, the aspect of worship in our spirit can be built only in in a person that has grown into full measure of growth in Christ or has left infancy where he previously was attracted by various winds of doctrine by the trickery of man. Further, if you paid attention, the waters that are in heaven, that is the elementary principles of Jesus Christ, that are imprinted upon the tablets of our heart, are not always in movement, but only according to only when God uh, speaks when uh, and this waters are in our heart that was previously placed there I have put wisdom in the hearts of all the gifted artisans that they may make all that I have commanded you Exodus 31 6 they only make noise these waters when God reveals the truth by his preached word and so the noise of the waters of heaven in our spirit is the revelation of God within our heart which speaks about what God does in the unseen world in our very body for ourselves then Elijah said to Ahab go up eat and drink Ahab didn't hear this uh, this sound but Elijah heard it go up eat and drink for there is a sound of abundance of rain so Ahab went up to eat and drink and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel then he bowed down then he bowed down on the ground and put his face between his knees for me it would be very difficult to put my face between my knees if you can imagine uh, how, how flexible Elijah must have been and probably uh, he didn't have very much weight on him to be able to do this and why he did this it's written that he went upon Carmel and he bowed down on the ground and put his face between his knees and said to his servant, go up now, look toward the sea. He hears the noise of rain, but he needs to call forth this rain. What you hear, what the Lord reveals within your heart, if you will not confirm it, then the rain won't come. The noise will stop because when we confess what do we do we confirm at this time if we will not confirm when we hear the word of God that is preached that reveals the truth in the heart we immediately need to confirm it with confession may it be according to your will according to your word you need to medita meditate about this truth you need to talk about it Go up now, look toward the sea, told the servant. So he, he went up and looked and said, there is nothing. And, and, and three and a half years, there was no rain. Everything's dry. The cattle is dying. People are dying. People are looking for water. And seven times he said, go again. Then it came to pass the seventh time that he said, There is a cloud, a, as small as a man's hand, rising out of the sea. So he said, Go up, say to Ahab, Prepare your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. 
Now it happened in the meantime that the sky became black with clouds and wind, and there was a heavy rain. So Ahab rode away and went to Jezreel. Then the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran ahead of Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. First Kings 18:41-46. If you can imagine this runner that was running, <coughs> the speed he was running at. I, I looked at how uh, horses can, can rein. It could be up to 60 kilometers an hour. It can't be possible that a runner can run like this, but he was running ahead of the horses all the way to Jezreel. God wants to show how the waters <coughs> thunder in the heavens, how they, if our new person has the uh, quality of Elisha, the Urim and Thummim that can hear the noise that is to come, the noise of the rain to come, then he could call forth this rain. You know, when Israel proclaimed the laws from uh, the two mountains, the curses and blessings, they confirmed God's law. When we confess the faith of God, we confirm this faith of God in ourselves. We confirm it. Not a single law that is uh, written in any country is confirmed until the, the uh, lawgiver uh, establishes it for the people. Many uh, laws of many presidents are not confirmed. For example, Obama had created many laws that Congress did not confirm or approve. And so when Trump came to power, the first thing he did for the half hour that he looked, all of these uh, laws that Obama wanted to implement, he canceled them. And the reason they were canceled is because Congress did not confirm them, approve them. If they would have confirmed or approved them, then uh, he would not have done that, been able to do that. And so when we confess the faith of God, we confirm our position in that promise that we received when you say Lord thank you that you have destroyed within my body the stronghold of death and erected the stronghold of life within my body you proclaim the not existent as existent and you in this, in this way confirm it and give God the right to uh, confirm it uh, for us so when the time comes to, to fulfill it he can do it for you Further. What is the earth within our body and what boundaries or ends of the earth is it referring to that God uh, rises as clouds from? The earth in our body is the aspect of our spirit that is the good soil of our heart that by the means of the ear of the heart is able to receive the preached word, uh, the seed of the preached word, and grow it. It's noteworthy that the phrase he uh, raises these clouds from the ends of the earth means you will lift up high to meet, to greet God, to uh, raise to the, th to the royal throne, to be offered as a sacrifice to quench God's hunger and thirst, to be called to service in the military, and to be prepared to lead battles at the same time the phrase the ends of the earth is talking about a specific boundary of responsibility for every individual person where he is called to fulfill God's will because when the scriptures say the ends of the earth then he is the one there's the one that sits uh, above the earth but so we don't see a boundary but he says I will show you in the scriptures it says the end of the earth but that means the ends of your, the boundary of your responsibility is what it's referring to this is the end of the earth that doesn't mean the earth itself is flat uh, but you carry responsibility for only that part of the earth in which you are in, the, in your house or somewhere else 
the church carries responsibility for a specific place, a city or more, but if a church becomes greater and larger, then she sp expands, she then carries responsibility for many regions. Therefore, the phrase he draws his clouds from the ends of the earth talks about the dedication of a person that is prepared to fulfill God's will that pursues a specific goal of God within the boundaries of our body. This is to destroy the stronghold of death in our body and to erect the stronghold of life in its place. First, the boundaries of the earth is the boundaries of our body that is created from this earth. Considering that the cloud of the Most High is to be led by the Holy Spirit, confirmation of the essence of the phrase he raises his clouds from the ends of the earth we see in another God inspired uh, book of David that even m more greatly uh, opens up uh, this truth surely his salvation is near to those who fear him that the glory may dwell in our land mercy and truth have met together righteousness and peace have kissed Truth shall spring out of the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yes, the Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him, and shall make his footsteps our pathway. Psalm 85, 9-13. And so what fruit our earth will bear is that fruit Methuselah is to bear Methuselah, or as we talked about Ephraim, to, so that we can expand impact in our body and so that we could be raised to the throne and rule over our body. The next phrase, he makes lightning for the rain, he brings the wind out of his treasuries. And so he makes lightning within the boundaries of our responsibility. Thus says the Lord God, enough, O princes of Israel, remove violence and plundering, execute justice and righteousness, and stop dispossessing my people, says the Lord God. You shall have honest scales, an honest ephah, and an honest bath. The ephah and the bath shall be of the same measure, so that the bath contains one-tenth of a homer, and the ephah one-tenth of a homer. Their measure shall be according to the homer. The shekel shall be twenty gira. 20 she shekels, 25 shekels, and 15 shekels shall be your mina. Ezekiel 45, 9 through 12. And the final phrase. He brings the wind out of his treasuries. We see that the accurate weight is the, uh, is the, is the lightning from the rain. This is talking again about God's ju judgment. We remember that when our spirit becomes strong, it gets the ability to receive the ability to judge ourselves and those under our responsibility. And so lightning is God's justice. And so he brings the wind out of his treasuries, indicates the fact that the treasuries of God are his clouds. The word wind is an identification of the atmosphere of a good heart. This is God's unapproachable light where God abides and from where God speaks. Wind, the spirit of life, the, bree the breeze of life, the breath of life, air identifying the atmosphere of life. Here it's talking about eternal life and not the regular atmosphere here on earth. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. That your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. First Corinthians 2, 4 through 5. Here it's not talking about an abstract uh, uh, work of the spirit and power, but the words that Paul, uh, Paul s speaks, they are the demonstration of the spirit and of power. They did not have the seal of human wisdom, but of spirit. Considering that our time is up today, we will bend our knees and we will pray. And all those who desire to resist the sin, fears, 
dependence from sin, fear before illness, untimely death, poverty. You can come here. The word that you heard can draw you out from doubt, from fear, and bring you into the liberty of Christ. Amen. Let us pray. I'm going to be praying your prayer and I ask you to repeat after me. Close your eyes, lift your hands to God. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I come to you. My heart is opened. You see my pain, my suffering, my shame because of sin. I hate sin. I reveal it before you. I reject the sin and I love your righteousness. I receive your justification as a gift of your grace. I receive your word, your promises into my heart about the destruction of the stronghold of death and the erection of the stronghold of life. And now, before heaven and hell, I want to proclaim that in accordance to your word, I am washed, I am cleansed, I am healed, I am restored, I am justified, and I am saved. Your sins are forgiven, and your trespasses in the name of Jesus Christ May the Lord bless you. May he look upon you with his great face and show you mercy and give you peace. May thousands and ten thousands attempt to come near you, but they won't touch you. May all these blessings, the blessings of the ancient mountains, and may the Lord destroy the stronghold of death in your body and erect in its place the stronghold of life. May all this be upon you and upon your children and be fulfilled upon you and the nation shall say, Amen. Confessions of our faith is confirmation of God's promises which we have received in the form of a seed. And again, I repeat, when we confess, we give God material, the Holy Spirit material, that will help us be clothed into our new person. Don't forget about that. Justify yourself. Stand upon the service of justification. It is enough to blame yourself. Even if you've sinned, don't blame yourself. You need to say, Lord, I have sinned before you. I hate sin. I reject the sin and I receive my justification. And the Holy Spirit will receive the materials to justify you. And you won't need to condemn yourself and lift your and put your head down. Or as one of the uh, Pentecostal pastors had said, if you receive justification, ask forgiveness. When you go to sleep, then you go wake up. You don't need to again ask for forgiveness. Begin to glorify God. But that brother came out and said, Brother and sister, you won't sin even if you wake up again and say it, Lord, forgive me. When I say, Lord, forgive me, after I receive justification, I do what? I, with my confessions, reject the justification that I received if I repeat this again. So be careful uh, with this service of, of condemnation. We're called to service of justification. May the Lord bless you. Let us proclaim our manifestation. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen.